a very short talk, so I'm going to give you a quick overview of about three decades of research that my students and I have done on how, when, and why happiness can shift over time. Acacia Parks earlier today talked about the tons of randomized controlled experiments that have been done that show that when the people can become happier when they deliberately practice what we call positive activity. So uh, practices like expressing gratitude, savoring the good things in your life, doing generous acts for others, acting optimistically. Um, and so these things can promote happiness, but recently I've become interested in the conditions under which um, some positive activities sometimes can actually undermine happiness and make us less happy. These are my collaborators. Um, and so my lab conducts what we call positive interventions. And a positive intervention is basically uh, an experiment in which people are instructed to do something that makes them, um, that has a positive outcome. Uh, positive interventions are kind of like clinical trials, but instead of, say, testing a, the efficacy of a drug, uh, we're testing the efficacy of a, ha of a happiness-increasing strategy. So over um, the years, we have conducted many uh, happiness interventions, and how they work is over the period of four or six or eight weeks or 10 weeks or 12 weeks, we ask volunteers to practice different kinds of positive activities like counting your blessings, living your life like it's your last month before moving away, making someone else happier, um, and then we follow people across the time and we measure their happiness. Um, uh, we, of course, always include various control groups or comparison groups to see how, how uh, those fare relative to people who are trying to become happier. Um, and so the focus of my lab has really been in trying to understand um, how and why happiness increasing strategies work. In more technical terms, this means exploring the mediators and the moderators that underlie the success of the pursuit of happiness. And so I'll just give you some examples of the kinds of studies we've done. The very, very first happiness intervention that we ever did was back in 1999, where we asked people to count their blessings, and everyone knows what that means. You uh, basically keep a gratitude journal, so what we did is every either three times a week or once a week over the course of the six weeks, we measured their people's happiness and well-being in all of our studies. We give multiple convergent um, measures of well-being. Uh, usually, we combine them into an index of happiness. In this study, we also measured gratitude because it was a gratitude study. Um, and what we found in this study um, was that these are histograms showing changes in gratitude and changes in happiness from before to after the six-week intervention. And you see the orange bars in the, in the middle. Um, show that people who counted their blessings once a week became more grateful over time and became happier over time. Um, people who counted their blessings three times a week actually experienced no benefit at all. And what this, these findings suggest to us is the importance of what I call uh, dosage. Um, these are sort of the factors that we need to consider uh, when you consider kind of designing the optimal happiness intervention. Um, and so dosage is sort of how frequently or how much are you doing the positive activity. If you count your blessings too often, if you try to count too many blessings, you might become bored, it might become tedious, but worse of all, you might actually run out of blessings to count, right? You might you might sort of, you can't think of anything else that to, to be grateful for, and that could actually backfire. And so one thing I'm interested in is, can counting too many blessings actually backfire and make you feel worse? And when you run out of things to be grateful for, you might, consider, you might conclude, I don't really have that many blessings in my life. You might feel actually more sad and more dismayed. Okay, another factor that we're looking at is variety. So it turns out the optimal amount of variety when you practice, when you pursue happiness, makes people happier, but a suboptimal amount of variety can actually backfire. And so this is a study where we ask people over uh, the course of 10 weeks to practice acts of kindness. And uh, you see people who did very different kinds of acts of kindness, this is the red line, they got happier over the course of the intervention, and they stayed happier even a month later. Um, but if you look at the green line, these are people who uh, were asked to do kind of the same types of acts of kindness over and over again, and they actually got less happy. So variety is really good. It's good to spice up the pursuit of happiness by doing novel and varied things. But when there's not a, uh, the right amount of variety, then you actually can become less happy. It can actually undermine your well-being. So there's another factor that's important. 
Now I want to tell you about motivation. So is there a kind of a right or appropriate or uh, optimal amount of motivation to be happy as opposed to kind of the wrong amount of motivation to be happy? So we explored this in another experiment where we asked people to try to become optimistic over the course of, um, this was uh, eight weeks, uh, or to try to be grateful. So um, in our optimism condition, we ask people to every single week to think about their life and to imagine their best possible self uh, in various domains in life, in career, in relationships, in uh, health. Um, sort of take a moment to sort of think about that everything has gone as well as it could have, and your dreams uh, have come true. Uh, so this is the optimism condition. We also had a gratitude condition where we asked people to write gratitude letters every week. So every week you choose someone in your life who's supported you, who's helped you, and you write them a letter. You can continue writing the, the letter to the same person every week, or you can choose a new person every week for eight weeks. And we do this for 15 minutes a week. Um, but we were really interested in the study uh, in motivation. So the way that we tested motivation for happiness is we recruited people into two different kinds of experiments. So, uh, one group of subjects was recruited to be in a happiness study. Like, do you want to be in a happiness study? Come be part of our experiment. And so people who self-selected themselves in this experiment, we call them the high motivation people. They're motivated to be happy. And then people who saw this ad that says, there's a generic happiness experiment. This study is about uh, doing cognitive exercises. Um, we call these the low motivation group because they specifically chose not to be in the happiness study. Uh, and so what we found here was the importance of motivation. So the yellow bars are people who are motivated, and the red, orange bars are people who are not motivated. So immediately after the intervention, the motivated people, who, people who are motivated to be happy, were happier. And this effect persisted even six months later. Six months is a really long time. This, these are uh, undergraduates, a uh, really long time in the life of an undergraduate. Um, and so this suggests that motivation matters as well, as well as variety. And so, it's really interesting because these, these um, uh, th so this study suggests that, that people who are motivated to be happy actually benefit more from pursuing happiness. They actually get happier. Now this is a little bit inconsistent with some recent work that has found, that is sort of on the dark side of happiness. And it has found that people who overvalue happiness, um, who agree with statements like, uh, how happy I am at any given moment says a lot about how worthwhile my life is. Um, they actually do worse, right? So they get less happy over time. In our experiment, people, these participants weren't like overly focused on happiness. They weren't obsessed with happiness. But clearly, if you're too focused on becoming happy, if you're too preoccupied with happiness, it might lead you to monitor your emotions too much. It might lead you to feel um, like a failure when some practice of gratitude, let's say you're practicing gratitude, and it doesn't elicit the expected sort of amount of happiness. Uh, it might make you feel like you're sort of entitled to happiness, or you might even deserve happiness sort of too much. It might make you feel overly self-focused. When, you, when you're too motivated to be happy, you might be too focused on the end goal as opposed to kind of enjoying the journey to get there. So clearly, the pursuit of happiness, no matter what the approach is, can backfire when you're sort of too invested in it, when you're too um, you know, um, focused on it. Okay, so uh, we did another study where we asked people to do acts of kindness for others, that's the red line, and we compared that to people who did acts of kindness for themselves. Now here's an intervention that you think might make people feel good, right? You treat yourself to a massage or to a lunch with a, a lunch, um, and it turned out that actually doing acts of kindness for yourself feels good in the moment, but it doesn't last. And so in this study, we found that doing acts of kindness for others made people happier, and then they maintained their happiness. Doing acts of kindness for themselves, sort of uh, uh, really no different than a control group. And we also, in a recent study, found that it also has health effects. People who did acts of kindness for others um, showed chi changes in their uh, RNA gene expression profiles that were associated with impu uh, improved immune responses. Um, and so this, uh, this finding suggests the importance of focusing on other people when you pursue happiness. So when you pursue happiness, when it, whatever you do, if it's overly self-focused or self-directed, that does not make people happy, that might actually backfire. That is actually really a theme in a lot of research on happiness, that happiness is really about other people. You know, other people mattering, connecting with other people, as opposed to being focused on yourself. Anything you can do to take the focus off of yourself and onto something else, whether it's other people or a work or a hobby, uh, is a good thing. 
Okay, a little bit of a digression there. Um, another finding from our laboratory is that culture matters. Um, in this room, I'm sure this is not a surprise to anyone sitting here. Um, here's an example of a study we, that we did where we compared students from Seoul National University in South Korea to students at UC Riverside where I teach. Um, and students wrote gratitude letters and they, did, and they also did acts of kindness. And so I'm gonna first show you the results for the American students on the left. And so you see the yellow line, um, American students who wrote gratitude letters every week got happier, so when the line is going up, that means people are increasing in happiness. Uh, American students who wrote gratitude letters also got happier. But the, the interesting part is what happened uh, with the South Korean students. So we found that South Korean students who did acts of kindness, those are, that's the red line, um, became happier, but South Korean students who wrote gratitude letters actually got less happy, a little bit less happy. This is not significantly less, but certainly didn't get happier. And we were really surprised by that finding because we'd always found that gratitude is happiness inducing. Um, and I uh, happened to be giving a talk in South Korea in Seoul about these data when they first came out. And what people told me is that, well, in South Korea, expressing gratitude can lead to sort of a mixed emotional experience, that when you express gratitude, there's a sense that the other person needs to reciprocate. Uh, you might feel guilty or indebted when you express gratitude. And the most interesting thing I heard, actually, is that in the United States, you know, in all of our studies, uh, who do you think are the top targets of gratitude letters? Mom and dad. Mom and dad are number one and number two targets of gratitude letters in the US. In Korea, I was told, parents will sometimes feel insulted when children thank them because it's something that they're doing as part of their parental duty. They might feel disrespected uh, that there's, there's an implication that, they're, that, that helping or supporting their child is optional. Um, and so gratitude just is very complex. Actually, we're finding now in, in lots of cultures that gratitude doesn't always feel good. It does make people happy. It makes you feel connected and uplifted and more humble. But sometimes it makes you feel guilty or indebted, right, because there's a burden to reciprocate. It might make you feel embarrassed or ashamed for having needed help in the first place. And then sharing gratitude can also, we've all had the experience sometimes, right, when we thank someone and it's awkward and maybe they don't take it well and they feel uncomfortable or awkward. Um, actually, I have a graduate student right now who's doing work on sort of the actual sharing and how that feels. Um, and so it's not always completely a positive experience. So, but very, very interesting. Uh, thing to study is gratitude. Okay, so um, I've been talking about all these different conditions under which positive activities um, can be sort of optimal, can be successful when dosage variety and all of these things are, uh, are, opt are kind of at the optimal levels. Um, but I'm also, as I said, really interested in sort of the conditions under which positive activities might backfire or go awry. And so I've summarized these in these five categories. Um, and the first category is about um, uh, d dosage, right? Um, when optimal dosage uh, might maximize gains in happiness, but suboptimal or inappropriate or incorrect dosage can actually undermine happiness. Um, but I think the biggest risk is with overdosing, not underdosing, right? So we've already talked about if you count too many blessings, if you express gratitude too frequently, when you repeat the same generous acts over and over again, um, you might actually feel less happy. Um, the second is about motivation. We sort of talked about this. When you value happiness too much, you might ask yourself too often, am I happy yet? Am I happy yet? Am I happy yet? That will sort of interfere with your happiness pursuit. Uh, you're sort of emphasizing too much uh, the end goal as opposed to the journey. And then uh, person activity fit. Um, we talked about culture. When there's a misfit, when there's a poor fit between your culture and your happiness activity, then that, that can backfire. But there can also be a misfit or a poor fit with your personality or your values or your goals. Uh, as one example, we did a study where we asked depressed undergraduate students to write gratitude letters, and they actually became less happy. We, we actually stopped the study in the middle for ethical reasons. And when we, when we talked to them, they said how some, some of them said, I couldn't think of someone to, be, to write a gratitude letter to, which made them feel even worse. Even if they did think of someone, they felt like um, they felt guilty that they had never thanked that person before. They felt guilty or ashamed that they hadn't reciprocated. Um, they felt um, over-benefited. They felt like they're a burden on other people who all these people are helping them and they can't reciprocate. And so we have to really be careful about um, you know, how we deliver these interventions. 
Uh, what I mean by mediators gone sour is when the pursuit of happiness leads to more negative emotions as opposed to positive emotions, when it leads you to feel less connected, less autonomous, less competent, as opposed to more connected or more competent, then that can make you feel more, more unhappy. And so an example, for example, um, is let's say you're trying to do acts of kindness for others, but, but they backfire. Like your act of kindness doesn't help. And that happens sometimes, right? You try to help and it just doesn't work. That makes you feel less competent. And so that makes you feel less happy. Um, the targets of your gratitude might uh, feel awkward or uncomfortable. That makes you feel worse. Um, when, you, when you help others too much and you neglect your own sort of self-care and well-being, we all know about caretakers who sort of help too much and they actually are prone to depression. Um, and so we have to sort of uh, think about, consider those issues. Um, and finally, something we haven't really talked about are the social costs of positive activity. So, so what is the impact of the pursuit of happiness, not just for the happiness seeker, but for people around that seeker, your friends, your spouse, uh, the targets of your gratitude, the recipients of your kindness. So for example, um, when you, um, uh, research shows that when you do acts of kindness that, are, that is really visible or direct, as opposed to subtle and invisible, people might feel like it might seem patronizing or people might feel like kind of ineffectual or not self-sufficient or vulnerable because they need the help. And so you have to be really careful about how you give social support, how you give kindness. And then witnessing kindness, uh, this is one of my favorite studies. We did a study in, at the Coca-Cola offices in Madrid where employees were asked to do acts of kindness for their colleagues and we found that witnesses of acts of kindness actually felt worse, right? So if you're a witness of your colleagues receiving kindness, maybe you feel envious, maybe sort of there's social comparison going on, you actually might feel worse. So witnessing kindness usually makes people feel better and uplifted and connected, but sometimes it makes people feel worse. So um, in sum, I wanna say that um, we can learn a great deal about happy, how happiness interventions can work by uh, studying how they when they don't work. And not just because it's sort of counterintuitive and it's interesting, but just we as well-being scientists, I as a well-being scientist, I think can learn a lot about when things go wrong about how to make them go right. And so I think it's really critical uh, to focus empirical attention on what may not be positive about positive activities. Thank you.